welcome the opportunity to speak on this bill, the Ambila Kosantalasu Fehe Fehe Kahar, the Defence Amendment 2024. I always have the, um, both the privilege and I don't know if it's privileged to be the last speaker on a Thursday afternoon. The bill has 24 sections, three parts and one schedule. And ostensibly, it sets out to do four things. Establishes an external oversight body on a statutory basis. There's already a body there. It's not on a statutory basis. And it's a good thing that this bill is now going to put it on a statutory basis. And that was one of the key recommendations of the independent review group, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, it creates a statutory framework for the Minister for Defence to grant consent to the Permanent Defence Forces Representative Associations to asso associate with the Congress of Trade Unions. And I fully support what Deputy Howland said earlier in relation to that and the reservations he has in terms of that will grant consent. Most unusual and I, I'd like to go into it. I'm just raising my concerns on it because I'm going to use my time to look at the external oversight body. Mainly, it provides a statutory basis for drug testing. That's already been in place and now it's on a statutory basis and that's good. And then it protects the term Ogli Nahirden, which is very welcome. And indeed, when we look at Ogli Nahirden, just before I go to that, I want to reiterate what my colleague Thomas Pringle has said. I want to thank the Library and Digest. And then on their last page, they tell us, the publication of the bill before the completion of the pre-legislative scrutiny process is, is not the intention of pre-legislative scrutiny. And of course, we don't need the Library and Research to tell us that. We know that, don't we, Minister? Standing orders allow it, but it's against the whole spirit of what pre-legislative scrutiny. And equally importantly, the library tell us that they were not in a position to assess the impact of pre-legislative scrutiny on the bill. So there's a big gap. We rely on that. We rely on them going through the traffic light system that they do with their different colours, and that's not we don't have the benefit of that. And so we struggle on and we look. And today it's a hundred years. It's actually 100 years in October since the Defence Forces Ogli Nehirn was formally established. And with the Executive Council of the Free State formally establishing Ogli Nehirn on the 1st of October 1924. So here we are 100 years later. And it's important as well what the Library has pointed out to us. And again, I'm praising them, but indeed for the first time I find a little fault with the narrative, which I hope I might come back to. It's very unusual for me. And it's worth remembering that the supreme command of the defence forces, the power is vested in the president. And some people have had a difficulty with that, I think, in terms of what he may or may not have said, but he's the supreme command. And also we have civilian authority over the defence forces provided by legislation. And of course, we have the army, the air corps, the naval service, and the reserve defence force. Most of the ordinary members of that underfunded and under-resourced. Again, I just note that for the record. But I also note that they are the aid to civil power and we rely on them. In, in something, the Volvo Ocean Race back in 2009 and later, the army were called in in South Park in the Clada when the, when, when, when the South Park, which is really a swamp, proved its usefulness and became a swamp and, and serves a purpose. But unfortunately, the organisers didn't realise that at the time and the army had to come in and, and save the day. And of course, multinational peacekeeping and humanitarian relief. Peacekeeping missions decided on a case by case basis on the basis of the triple lock. And I can tell you, I am horrified by what's happening, Minister. And earlier on, Deputy Howland asked you a question. Will, will, if you're going to go ahead with the foolishness, and foolishness doesn't capture it, with the disaster decision to get rid of the triple lock, will you do the honest thing and do that openly and account to be with separate legislation? Or is it to be sneaked in here somewhere along the line? And I hope, Minister, and I really respect your bona fides, that you will be outspoken in relation to this matter of, of doing away with our triple lock. So that's the background. I can't believe that the Taoiseach, Taunish, I know, and I know he had to go away, but I never like talking behind somebody's back, but I'm talking publicly. And he's given a speech here of seven pages, and I've looked in vain for the phrase or the women of honour. We're here because of the women of honour, and of course we're here because of a lot of other steps along the way and in, um, 
finding stuff were ignored. And I have a six and a half pitches, I, I, almost seven, seven, and not a mention of the women of honour. And so we're here today as a result of an external oversight body that we has set up that's going to be set on a statutory basis and that came from the independent review and we have an ongoing tribunal as we speak and we'll be very careful in relation to that but how could a speech be given and not recognize what the women of honor did on behalf of men and women in our arm in our defense forces how could that happen so let me write them back into history because it really is very important The, exist the external oversight body, I think, is a very good, a very good um, proposal in this legislation. And there's going to be between seven and nine members and a chairperson. However, the greatest concern is that they're all going to be appointed by a minister. Okay? And from what I've read, that goes against what the cross-party committee wanted and what the representatives that came forward wanted it. So every single one of them will be appointed by a minister. And then various things are set down for their term of office and so on. In relation to the, just the background, let me just quickly go through the background as quickly as I can, how this has arisen today. Back in 1990, it's important to give the years and the perspective and then ask how could we be standing here today without recognising the women of honour. The report of the Commission of Renumeration and Conditions of the Gleeson Commission report outlined inadequacies in the grievance procedure, the victimisation of people, victimisation back in 1990 who apply for redress and the urgent need for a more effective system of redress. Tom Clonan, who is now distinguished senator, in his research, women in combat, the status and roles assigned female personnel in the permanent defence forces, almost a quarter of a century ago. Let me just read out what, what his report said. And of course, I'm, I hope I'm not um, misquoting, but I understand he himself suffered huge harassment, abuse, victimisation in relation to that. So women in combat, the status and roles assigned female personnel in the permanent defence forces. Anonymised interviews, anonymised with 60 female officers, 59 of whom suffered abuse or discrimination, 12 of whom said they had been sexually assaulted or raped. Bullying, sexual harassment and assault, including rape. Initially, of course, there were huge attempts to discredit Tom Clonan, Senator Clonan's research. In 19, Senator Clonan, he wasn't a senator at the time, he thought that the Defence Forces had taken on board his research and made the necessary changes. He wanted to believe that that happened. He was led to believe that that happened. He has since retracted that. And following the, the Women of Honour broadcast, act, uh, that's just in relation to his PhD, then in March 2001, we had Dr. Shirley Graham, submission to the Commission on the Defence Forces, another Commission on the Defence Forces, PhD re research in gender. What did she find out? She was sexually harassed herself by a male defence uh, member of the Defence Forces while on a field commission. It outlined sexual assault and a peacekeeping mission, and so on. I, I, some a chapter was never included largely due to our concerns over potentially exposing women in the defense forces to backlash this is back this is 2021 so i've jumped forward and back in relation to this just to give a taste of what 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 went on from 1996 the independent monitoring group was set up they had three reports their final report was 2014 and they noted from 1996, 1996, there had been concern among senior management in the permanent defence forces about some level, some level of unacceptable work practices, though the extent was unresearched and uncertain. References to gender inequality are often accompanied by the caveat that these issues are not exclusive to the defence forces, but exist. So an effort to minimise, marginalise and not look at what was happening. This is from 96 on. Some measures were put in place to address discrimination and they were in, in name only. And there was a designated contact person and so on. The Defence Forces Annual Report 2020 got one page, gender equality and diversity roughly make up one page of a 120 page document. And I think Women of Honour got a scarce mention in that. Okay. The independent 
monitoring group that was set up, looking at it at face value seemed to do a good job and produced reports. And what happened to that? That was disbanded or ignored. Disbanded or ignored completely. So there were no more reports from 2014. And up to that date, nothing, nothing uh, had happened. In between, we had a UL research place, workplace climate in the Defence Forces, telling us many respondents expressed reluctance in using the redress of wrong systems. So we have a system and we don't use it. Now bear in mind that we have a tribunal of inquiry set up to look to see did the, the, the grievance process work. We know well it didn't work. So, so we have double and double layers of, of evasion hypocrisy and avoidance here all of the time. The re review group, or the whatever it was called, that led to the tribunal, they gave their findings on the 28th of March, the final report. There was recommendations under 13 headings, and they said we would need an oversight body, and we need the establishment of deaths by suicide among current and former defence members of the defence, an establishment of a restorative justice process, and so on. I'm not sure where any of those stand, Minister, at the moment, and I didn't see any of them outlined in the Thornishta's seven-page speech. There was 55, 13 recommendations, as I said, with 55 sub-recommendations, very comprehensive, makes it very difficult, however, to follow and allows the government off the hook in monitoring just that set up. Quotes, just selective quotes, but they're not biased quotes. I went, read the whole report. Notwithstanding the role of the Defence Forces, neither men nor women in the Defence Forces are working in a safe environment, page 16 on the inadequacy of the complaints process. And remember now, we have a tribunal looking at it, rather than the abuse and the failure of the, of the complaints process. Apart from the horrendous nature of the alleged rapes and sexual assaults suffered and described in great detail to the IRG, what happened afterwards, so what happened afterwards is of equal concern. Instead of delivering a proper, modern, streamlined and skilled response to the complaint, to the complainant, the individual was often told to bury the complaint, or they were asked whether they seriously wanted to follow up on that complaint. Bungled investigations that lasted for years were the order of the day. Page 53. Page 16. Survey respondents cited a clear lack of trust in the current procedures for making a complaint. A clear lack of trust. The majority of respondents stated that they did not make a formal complaint of bullying harassment because there was no point. The prevailing workplace culture, still on page 16, is one that is disabling when it comes to supporting dignity and respect in the workplace. The independent review group's analysis reveals a workplace where self-worth and value are negated and disrespect is a dominant feature in an organisation resistant to change. And so if they didn't make complaints and the tribunal that has been set up is investigating complaints, and it was entirely unclear to us on this side of the house whether those that didn't make complaints would come under the terms of reference because it was never specifically set out. We do have it on record that the Taoiseach and the Thornishta has repeatedly said it does, it will allow for people to come forward that didn't make mistakes. I have no idea why that wasn't set out in the terms of reference. I have no idea why we had to use our energy to ask repeated questions to get that finalised. And I have no idea why the women of honour weren't included in the terms of reference, at the very least, to acknowledge the work that they did. So I'm here today now, again, in trouble with legislation that I want to support. And I will support it at this stage with the view to amendments being made and scrutiny at the amendment stage. But we should not be in this position here today. And we should not be in the position where the women of honour, and I only, I'm using them for all of the courageous people that fed into that and gave them the strength to go forward and do the 
radio show with Katie Hannan. And then that takes me back to the digest. And I usually have no gripe with the digest. However, if the narrative in it fits in with the narrative, and I'm making no allegations here at all, it's just something that strikes me. The narrative in the digest is the same as the narrative from the Defence Forces. It just happens to be, I think, in that situation, um, is because they talk about, as opposed to recognising what happened, we're told there was the, the reports, which is very good, in the intervening years, which have seen the introduction of a regulatory framework for the defence forces that underpins the policy systems and procedures and so on. It has been acknowledged, notwithstanding that, that more work was needed in this area. Now, I would say that is the greatest understatement that I've ever read in my life, that more work was needed in this area. The next paragraph goes on to say, following discussions between the Secretary General of the Department of Defence and the former Chief of Staff, which took place in 2021, it was decided that there should be a back to basics, external and independent review to assess whether these policy systems and procedures are fit for purpose. And on this basis, and also on foot of engagements, we got the IMG process set up. Now, what, what I have a little difficulty with that, and I, I, I'm not, it's not a personal thing at all that completely minimizes the effort and it gives the impression that there was a proactive movement from the government with the defense forces management of course to do something when that's entirely wrong entirely wrong and I'm sure it's been done inadvertently but I couldn't let it go because I want to balance the narrative of what it took to get the changes that we have seen for those women to go on the Katie Hannan show and do a documentary. And like many other things in your life where you remember where you were, I was coming back from Sligo. There were four of us in a car and I, there wasn't a word as we listened to what they related on the Katie Hannan show. Absolute silence. Now, somewhere in this narrative, we have to acknowledge that and acknowledge what was behind them leading to that, because no woman that I know would do that unless it, they absolutely had to do it. And so now we're here today following all of that, and we have no, we're going to have an oversight body that's not independent, or certainly there's questions about it. All of them were going to be appointed by a minister, including the chairperson. And I'm going to finish on my last two minutes by just making a few general points again in relation to what our defence forces are 100 years later. And the clue is in the title, they're defence forces. I am very proud of them, and we have a barracks in Galway. I am very proud, as mo everybody here in the Dáil is, of our defence forces. And we all stand fully behind their uh, requests, our demands, for the most basic um, conditions in terms of money and conditions. However, what's happening under your watch, Minister, and I don't wish to personalise this, is truly shocking. This is not an army. Ireland will never be able to have an army. We don't need an army. We're an independent, neutral, sovereign country. Our strength lies in our independent voice. Our strength lies in making the UN institutions better to function better. It is utterly misleading to say changes to the triple lock are necessary and we need to tinker with them. It is dangerous, disingenuous and unacceptable. And you will be in serious trouble as a party if you persist in going down the road of changing the triple lock. We need transformative action. The it's the one word that Thornishta has used repeatedly, transformative action. Well, we need transformative action as well to stop wars. We cannot be cheerleaders for wars. There is nothing to be gained by joining up with the military industrial complex that Europe is heading absolutely in the middle of with a European Defence Fund, a European Defence Agency, a Partnership for Peace, which is a, a travesty of the English language because it's a partnership for war. And our voices should be used over and over to stop the war in the Ukraine, to stop Israel, what they're doing, the genocide that's going on there. And I'd like to hear our voices used for that, not sidelined into tinkering with a triple lock that is simply 
unacceptable and it's an insult to the Defence Forces who have served as well. And if anything captured that lately was the announcement to withdraw our peacekeeping forces from the Lebanon or the Golan Heights and have them ready for a battlefield, which they can participate in, but they have to be ready for the day that they need to go to battle at the helm of van der Leyen and Borrell, who's talked about Europe as a garden and everything else outside of it as a jungle. Garmagat Kankorla.